health professionals. He is focused on advancing the quality of care and fostering leading interprofession interprofessional pra practices. He was recently appointed as the chair of the Ontario Hospitals Association Suicide Prevention Standards Task Force, a diverse panel of researchers, academics, clinicians, and lived experience experts with a mandate from the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care to focus on establishing best practice, evidence-based standards to guide the care for at-risk people in all of Ontario's 151 hospitals. Dr. Daw is the mental health and addictions physician lead for the Central East Local Health Integration Network, providing expert advice to their uh, CEO and its senior directors on performance and improvement opportunities in the mental health systems within Ontario. He's also the immediate past chair of Ontario's Clinical Expert Committee on Autism. Dr. Daw completed medical school at Memorial University of Newfoundland and a residency in psychiatry two years of follow -up, follow -up, fellowship training, suicide studies, emergency psychiatry, and mental health services systems research, and a master's degree in health administration, all at the U of T. His clinical and research areas of interest include recovery, telemental health and virtual care services, suicide and suicidal behaviors, emergency psychiatry, quality and patient safety, health advocacy, and the design and evaluation of mental health delivery systems. With that, I'd like to present Dr. Ian Daw, and he'll be providing us with a presentation. Uh, there will be a video recording of his talk that uh, we'll be able to see on a local BC website. So, thank you. Thank you. Do you have the clicker? I do, right here. Well, Hazel, uh, wherever my mom is at the moment, she's smiling a lot because you read that exactly as she wrote it. <laughs> um, so that's really nice. As a native Newfoundlander, um, I feel very at home here on the island, uh, especially with the naked bungee jumping piece. I, <laughs> I, I, I clearly missed something at the uh, front desk. Um, I'm going to have to go out after this and uh, check that. It's a, it's a pleasure, absolute pleasure to be here. I actually had the opportunity to fly in yesterday and I spoke with some of the island health, uh, health IT people uh, collaborating on some of the technology pieces that you're doing with that. Uh, and it was a fascinating, fascinating afternoon. Um, however, today um, we're here to talk about recovery. And that for me has really been a passion uh, for most of my career actually. I mean as you heard I started working in psychiatric emergency services in the early 1990s and uh, saw emergencies, saw people really in, in oftentimes the worst shape of their lives and was very motivated uh, to get involved to do more than just uh, to paraphrase, treat the symptoms, uh, to really look at the social determinants of health. Perhaps that comes from a background of coming from an island where people struggled with social determinants uh, for a long time. I don't really know what it was, but the notions uh, founded in recovery and treating people as people, not as patients, not as things, um, has always resonated with me. Uh, even before I knew it was a thing called recovery, that, that whole uh, approach uh, has really been something that um, has shaped my career. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. Um, we, we're going to ground the uh, discussion today um, in uh, some of the experiences. Uh, are we on here? Perhaps not. Well, I can do this. We're going to ground the discussion in um, some of the uh, concepts and some of the standards that have recently been released by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Um, however, the Mental Health Commission of Canada does not pay me. I'm not a, a paid spokesperson of the commission. Oh, I'll keep trying it. But, um, it, it very much is, uh, I think, just an aligned uh, philosophy. And, and when they heard that we were doing that work at Ontario Shores, it became part of the collaboration that we've worked on together. Um, the disclosure slides that I have, uh, that's a systems consulting job, you know, how to help uh, hospitals uh, align their, their best practices, how to involve clinical practice guidelines or health IT technologies. It's uh, really a public sector funded uh, consulting arrangement. I am an employee uh, of Ontario Shores, that's my, uh, my home hospital, and, and an employee of Central East, uh, the local health integration network. 
uh, and the University of Toronto. So I have employee relationships with all those. But um, over the last five years, I, I have made a principle of not accepting direct industry uh, funded uh, honorarium. So whatever you hear today from me is me. Yeah. <laughs> Let's engage in a debate about it. Let's, uh, you know, we can, you can uh, be passionately disagreeing. As a Newfoundlander, that's kind of fun for me when we engage in stuff. Um, so comments, criticisms, negative judgments, all that stuff I welcome uh, as part of the dialogue. Um, but let's, let's see how we get started. That's fine. I, I can do it. Let's try that. Oh, look at that. It was just off. <laughs> Um, so I have no, no potential conflicts of interest, as I was saying, except this one. Um, we did sign the Declaration of Recovery from the Ministry, uh, from the, the Mental Health Commission. We were an early adopter at it, Ontario Shores. And again, that was a principled uh, perspective. Um, we wanted to declare that recovery uh, publicly was the mission, the vision, and the values of Ontario Shores. Uh, so when we heard that the, the Commission was doing a recovery declaration, we wanted to be, if not the first, uh, one of the top three, uh, first three people that uh, had engaged in that. And um, May 24th, I think we were pretty close to, to being one of the first organizations on board. On a principled notion, I think we all want a more person-centered healthcare system one that supports people to make informed decisions uh, to successfully manage their lives and their own health care, including choosing when sometimes to let other people act on their behalf. That's, I think, an unarguable point. Everybody's interested in that. We want health care services to deliver care that's responsive to people's needs, their individual abilities and preferences, their lifestyles and goals. Similarly, there's not, there's not much arguable point in those desires. But what that means, what that requires is a change, a change in behavior and mindsets, both on the clinician side and on the service user side. And it needs to be supported by a system that really puts people at its center. And we've been talking about patient-centered care or person-centered care for nigh on 35, 40 years. It's easy to talk about. It's actually much harder to do. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Because while the principles underlying patient-centered care make a lot of sense, uh, who doesn't want dignity, personalization, compassion, coordination? While those things make sense, the actual activities that person-centered care articulate are much more challenging to the status quo. Self-management, shared decision-making, these things involve the willingness to cede power, either perceived power or real power, and to change the dynamics of relationships. That's really what it takes to uh, have a shared decision-making authority when you value the person sitting across the table from you and what they want as much as what we would want for them. It may be that housing is the first thing on somebody's mind, not symptom control. It may be education or getting a job or getting back into the workforce, not the reduction of auditory hallucinations or the treatment of uh, this medication versus that medication. And in that relationship, that has to be somehow okay. We have to reconcile that we may have differing uh, perceptions. But recovery is all about that. Recovery is truly, and I think for me, it's been about seeing the person as an expert, as an expert in their lives, as an expert in their experiences, as an expert truly in what it takes to be that person. Me, I'm just the kind of knowledge professional or the knowledge broker, and together we're going to try to do something that neither one of us can do as an individual, which is to work on not just illness control, but eventual wellness. So as I said, those types of things just made intuitive sense to me. Uh, it's only in kind of the earlier parts of my career that I came around, wow, there's actually philosophy that I can call that. That's, that's recovery. The willingness to cede power has, has been, I think, one of the things that 
uh, has made recovery a challenge um, to move from just the articulating the principle to actually doing the activity. So over the next um, 40 minutes or so, um, here's what I thought we might try to accomplish. We'll talk about the recovery philosophy of care and, and how uh, we have tried to integrate it at Ontario Shores. How that will be uh, enhanced, I think, by going through the experiences of the Commission and what the Commission's principles are. As I said, I, I'm looking at that from an outsider's lens, not as an, as an insider of the Commission. And, and we'll talk about the Ontario Shores context. Um, because one of the wonderful things about being part of the leadership team there is you actually get to influence the way things happen. Um, and that's kind of fun. So uh, hopefully, uh, as, um, as I wrap up my time on Ontario Shores, somebody will look back and say, yeah, you know, there's a difference there. Um, and and uh, I think then I will be quite, quite proud of the activities. So um, in the spring of 2006, uh, Michael Kirby's landmark report came out, Out of the Shadows at Last. And it called for recovery to be at the uh, center of mental health reform. So Senator Kirby at that time really started to articulate this philosophy that it should be centralized. And it wasn't really absent uh, from the dialogue. Lots of people were practicing those types of recovery principles. They were doing it in isolation. Certain organizations, certain community-based centers, uh, certain movements um, were in that kind of phenomenon. But Kirby started to bring that together, both from a, a call for policy and a call for practice. And now, many provinces and territories are starting to take up that, that movement. It's really coming together. Lots of important initiatives, as you've just heard, are really starting to focus on that notion of embracing recovery as a goal for transforming the system. A recovery orientation also underlies the, the heart of changing directions and changing lives, the mental health strategy of Canada that was released in 2012. And to quote that strategy document, um, an orientation to recovery is helping to bring about important changes in the mental health systems of many countries. Here in Canada, recovery has strong roots in the advocacy efforts of people with lived experience and in the psychosocial rehabilitation field. Recovery and well-being form the basis of this strategy and are now embraced in most provincial and territorial mental health policies. It really started to, to draw the spotlight on it. And that strategy, oh sorry, I focused on The strategy um, looked for two specific recommendations to follow in the dialogue of uh, recovery orientation. One, implementing a range of recovery-oriented initiatives throughout Canada including the development of the guidelines. And two, promoting the education and training of mental health professionals uh, and other service providers in the recovery-oriented approaches. So the Commission launched <coughs> excuse me, its recovery initiative to help exhilarate and adopt the recovery-oriented practice in Canada. The first, there was three things that they did through this strategy. One was the recovery declaration. I showed you ours. Uh, here it is again. Um, number two was a recovery inventory, um, really again focused on the notion of um, a standard that people can go and see online of tools and resources and supports and people can upload and download into this um, to really help um, continue that dialogue. It's an international database of recovery oriented resources. And the third one was the recovery guidelines, um, which we'll, we'll talk about now in the next few minutes. The release of that declaration and of the inventory did precede the guidelines uh, as, as they came forward. So the guidelines, what, what's the guidelines? What's about the guidelines? I think it is an important contribution um, to achieving those strategies and those recommendations. They constitute a key element of what the Commission's been doing over the last couple of years, as I've heard about it. And they build on those um, efforts of individuals and, and organizations. Stakeholders and recovery champions have been coming together across the country to participate in those dialogues and work with the Commission to identify what uh, the recovery-oriented approach should be. 
And the guidelines have been written to really provide that one comprehensive Canadian reference guide uh, about promoting consistent adoption of what recovery is all about. It's about underlying a conceptual framework uh, to help transform culture and help transform practice. It's about promoting the centrality of people with lived experience as, again, the centerpiece, not as tokens, but as meaningful experts in what that experience is actually like, um, in co-designing and delivering systems <coughs> and programs together. It's about identifying principles and values and knowledge and skills and behaviors that will help um, move that process forward. Uh, assisting in the implementation of, of a recovery-oriented practice. The guidelines are certainly designed to do that. Provide a benchmark by which to measure. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how on Ontario Shores, we've chosen to look at that last one, the measurement of recovery uh, in the workshop this afternoon. So lots of people will take um, recovery from a number of different perspectives, but for me, in the last few years, sitting on top of, of a mental health and addictions organization. These are the ones that have really um, triggered my interest because this is a, really about transforming a system and transforming an organization. What are the aspects of recovery that leaders need to look at to try to align the way a system works? And, and I think there's four of them. One, it's about vision, commitment, um, and values. Uh, one, it's about the value of the lived experience, uh, of about promoting partnerships because no one can do this alone, uh, and the workforce development. So over the next few minutes, I'd like to take each one of those and, and dive into it in a little bit uh, uh, of a greater perspective. So the first issue is transformative, I think, and it's directed at the organizations, not at the individuals or individual clinicians or individual people. It's about how an organization's uh, mission, vision, and values, its identity, whether it supports recovery as a core business proposition or if it sees recovery as a nice to have. Um, the centrality of that mission, of that vision, uh, about how to align services together. Whether the, really that organization's vision reflects the belief that people not just can, but should exercise their rights to make decisions, uh, to exercise their capacities and capabilities, and to truly recover, if I, w if I could. The physical, the social, the cultural aspects of what that service looks like, and whether it's humanistic uh, in its nature, whether it truly pays attention to the social determinants of health, and whether all of its staff are engaged uh, in that mission. We talked about values a little bit. And I think the value or an attitude of an organization and of the people that work in that organization, this is about whether they, they recognize that promoting recovery, again, is their primary work. It is the business of the day. Um, recovery doesn't happen after the interaction with the mental health system. Recovery is the interaction with the mental health system. Um, and how the services can truly be focused to provide that best effort, that best support. Acknowledging the importance of being inclusive uh, and seeking, actively seeking and maximizing opportunities to um, get people exercising their self directions and taking responsibility for their own direction. Knowledge and skills and behaviors have to then uh, percolate through an organization um, about keeping up to date with best practices. Uh, best practices in treatment, best practices in recovery. Um, knowing ways to maximize a person's ability uh, to exercise control over their journey and being able to access tools and supports and services as required um, to help that cultural change come along. The skills, the behaviors, what happens in there. Um, this is about the championing, championing of, of the mission and the values and promotion. That this, this is what the organization teaches and onboards its new staff with. It provides ongoing uh, support for its current employees, continuing through. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, again, our Ontario Shores journey towards the end. 
But conceptually, it's about continuing to provide that ongoing educational piece. The second one, um, and perhaps, although I guess everybody will say each principle is, is the important one, perhaps this is the most important one. <laughs> It's certainly synonymous with how most people think about recovery, the principle of valuing lived experience. So experiential knowledge of people living with mental health concerns, their families, their friends, their support network is respected and invited to the table. And you can invite people to the table and wave at them and acknowledge that they're sitting there. Or you can involve them meaningfully in this. Um, Hazel introduced a uh, recent job that I, I have with the Ontario Hospital Association on suicide prevention. And just as an aside, um, I know working at Ontario Shores how hard it is to involve and change policy at one organization. This is 151 organizations and needless to say I was a little intimidated um, <clears throat> when I was asked to, to do that. But in doing so, I, I insisted I was not going to take the job unless we had meaningful contributions and people with lived experience and their families at the table. That, that was the bargaining point. I, I wouldn't do this. Um, because as much as I've studied about suicide and as much as I've looked at the reasons for why people take their lives, um, having survivors at the table, having attempters at the table, having people who've considered that at the table to tell us about their experience and to help co-design the system accordingly, that's the only way transformative things could take place. And it was a really important aspect for me. So the valuing of lived experience, I think, is, is a critical piece. And wherever I go, I try to make sure that the organization um, is open to that notion of drawing on that lived experience and, and having that at the table. Because it's, again, it's about values and attitudes. Whether you're open and enthusiastic to, to learn from and be challenged by um, people's experiences. To hear when things work, and more importantly, when things don't work, and to change accordingly. Um, I heard this great story, actually, from one of our um, uh, patient support folks and the patient experience people. Now, this isn't the peer support folks. This is more the, the complaints department. It's nicely called patient supports. Um, but she was telling me <coughs> that, um, and I, I hired her into this job, and she was telling me in recent times that um, she, she tends to hear on the phone or by email or by meetings uh, all the things that are wrong with the organization. And it's a tough thing to do, actually, to, to always hear from people when they're unhappy. Um, but it's a really critically important job. And she was telling me how she actually goes about that. She was saying that every time she hears a call that is a complaint or it's a negative or it's constructive criticism, she looks at her desk and on her desk is a picture of her family and her kids and her husband. And she goes through a little mental exercise of imagining it's them on the phone telling their story. And she said the first time she did that, it was, and I quote, transformative. That's that word that we'll come back to a number of times here. Because she learned in that exercise, how can I defend the status quo to my kids? How can, if it was them, if it was their, if it was my husband who was coming in, how can I say that it's okay that this happened to you, whatever that negative encounter was? Um, so as soon as she told me that, I of course jumped all over it and I tried to get everybody to put pictures of their kids on their <laughs> tables and so on. And when I get calls and complaints, I find myself now looking at the pictures of my kids and my wife uh, on the table. Um, and I didn't even, you know, I was already a recovery guy. Um, but it is a remarkable experience to do whatever it takes to open that door of communication. Again, to see people as people, not patients, uh, not as uh, members of uh, the population who are afflicted by this devastating illness. It is a devastating illness, but that doesn't change the fact that they're people. It doesn't change the fact that they have experiences and they have a valued aspect to contribute to that dialogue. 
they're suitably qualified. They're credentialed, in fact, uh, if nothing else, in, in the experience of being with this illness. And it, uh, it takes a while, admittedly, uh, for some people to get used to that uh, and to have those dialogues and to have that experience. But it is important. It is critical. It is about what recovery uh, truly um, happens. So knowing uh, about that um, and knowing where these standards come into play, it's, it's seeing the accessibility and how a workplace really supports the, the psychologically safe aspects of it. Psychologically safe workplaces uh, are, are all the rage these days in terms of the workforce. If we're actually thinking about expanding the workforce, we've got to think about expanding that notion of who it's safe for and how those discussions will take place. Providing opportunities for people in recovery to learn and to participate in peer support um, so that they can go out and assist other people who are going through those difficulties as well. In, I'm going to skip one. In, in core principle number three, uh, it's about again that promoting of partnerships. Because when you get to partnership discussions, you quickly realize, again, you can't do this all, at the, all in one person. One organization isn't capable of providing everything that it takes to look at the social determinants of health. Interestingly enough, in Ontario, we're starting to undergo uh, Mental Health Reform 3.0, um, which kind of gives some question about whether Mental Health 1.0 and 2.0 were ever effective. But we're in 3.0 right now. Uh, and 3.0 uh, is from the minister's uh, speech just a couple of weeks ago about structural reform. And it's going to be, uh, the anticipation is going to involve, uh, using uh, industry language here, excuse me, vertical integration so that hospitals uh, will have much more ability to go out and directly contract and directly get involved in housing. Uh, to directly get involved in supportive employment. So we're not having to hand over uh, that um, responsibility to another organization where somebody can fall through the cracks in that transition, where there'll be continuity of care. Now, it's not actually about, I don't believe, hospitals taking over the world, uh, although some people feel it is that way. Um, but it, I think, really, it's the advantage of having that continuity. Where, where one organization can really help assist people in all aspects of it. And it's about that partnership kind of notion. Um, partnerships do increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of a mental health system um, by making the best use of complementary resources. And practitioners have to be involved in working through those sound partnerships to facilitate access to locally specific services. Um, here the values and attitudes are about looking beyond what's in your own organization and what can be seen in other places and going out and having those memorandums and those responsibilities to engage in those partnerships so that our people can flow through them without gaps. Recognizing the value and the contribution of interprofessional care and all of the disciplines that are involved in truly promoting health. Yeah, health is a hard thing to get to. Um, Illness control is just one aspect of that, as you've already heard. Um, but it is the job of all of us uh, to work in that regard. And the economic needs, the transportation needs, the social, the recreational opportunities have to be about people coming together um, to provide that grand notion of the social determinants of health. I mean, it, it always strikes me, but we always have to remind ourselves, Canada in the 1970s with the Lalonde Report was one of the first, the first countries in the world to talk about the social determinants of health. This is our language, this is our history, and we're having to come back to it now and recognize its place in healthcare. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe it's about using substitute decision makers and sometimes using advanced care directives. That's okay as long as it's part of the system and it's part of the parcel of supporting people throughout their spectrum of care. It all has a place. It's ensuring the common understanding, understanding excuse me, of the respective goals uh, in the parties that are coming together in these principles. 
And finally, the, the core principle that I wanted to talk about um, was workforce development. Because there's a lot of us who've been in this game for a while. Um, but we constantly are bringing new people into the system. And how do we make sure that those new people in the system are recovery centric, are going to not be crushed by the status quo uh, where recovery isn't the business of the day? They're actually graduating, interestingly enough, with these principles in mind. The struggle is how to keep those principles um, so that they don't hit the ground and in their first year get uh, waylaid by the traditional ways of doing things. So workforce development has been an important aspect for me. And a recovery-oriented organization, I think, again, is one that is knowledgeable and participatory in education. It's uh, compassionate and collaborative. Its skills are diverse. Uh, it values, again, that experiential experience and having it as front and center as a positive attribute. Engaging in that continuous learning and development and the skills necessary to, to do this work. We strive for it. Um, we're open to changing. We create that culture that it's okay to pivot um, with new knowledge. And in fact, as an academic organization, we welcome that contribution. We want to be challenged. We don't want to be doing things which are anachronistic or which are, are actually harmful. If we're faced with evidence that what we're doing is not productive, then we need to be open to changing that and to recognizing the dignity by which those criticisms and concepts are offered. How the core aspects of an environment uh, support that, uh, I think, is truly the measure of whether a recovery-oriented system is an effective one. Uh, and again, this afternoon we'll talk in a little bit more detail about the measurement of an organization and of its practices uh, specifically. I think again, uh, this is really all about uh, the promotion of personal recovery and how an organization can align itself to be part of that or to be a barrier to that. Um, as, as necessary. And we can do it really badly. We've got lots of experience of doing it really badly historically. Um, I think we're starting to get there. We're starting to have those discussions. Are we, are we there yet? No, of course not. The Commission wouldn't have to release guidelines to support that if we were there, if the system was the way we dream and, and imagine it to be. But it's getting there, slowly but surely. You guys are inviting people like me to come talk to you. I mean, th that's, that says something, right? That, that's, that's an important part of the dialogue uh, that we continue to have. So in the last few minutes, let me tell you about a, a little bit about Ontario Shores because uh, moving from what the concepts are, I wanted to illustrate um, how we've chosen uh, to do these things. Um, and uh, I think that, that hopefully will leave you with um, some, some notion of how this is living, uh, at least in the Ontario context. Ontario, Ontario Shore's journey uh, in the recovery notion actually did predate me. Uh, I joined the organization six years ago as the physician in chief. Um, actually in 2008, when um, the organization had just divested, formerly as a provincial psychiatric hospital and an asylum, um, there was a, a mental health facility on our grounds since 1914. Um, and, you know, 90 years of doing things one way, well, it, uh, it really has a way of creating a, a pretty embedded, robust culture. With divestment came the opportunity to become a public hospital. And with a public hospital, you bring on a new board of directors, a new senior leadership team, all kinds of things. It provided a really unique opportunity to truly pivot. And Glenna Raymond, uh, who was our CEO at the time, um, took on recovery. And she said, this is how I want our organization to do. And I can tell you, I wasn't there at the time, but I've talked to lots of people who were. Almost every single person went, what? <laughs> you want to do what? That's not what we do. Uh, wh what are you talking about? Um, but she had a board of directors who actually were very um, responsive. And they said, go ahead, put your foot on the floor, on, put your foot on the accelerator, cram it to the floor, and keep going. This, this is important, uh, and we'll support you. 
And slowly but surely, Ontario Shores emerged out of the uh, history of asylum-based care into what I think now um, stands, um, or I'm pretty proud of it, as, as, a, as a leading recovery-based organization. Do we do it all the time? Do we fail? Yes, of course we fail. Um, but um, there's some things here that I wanted to show you uh, that I think illustrate what we did. And we started with a big bang approach. What Glenna had decided to do was, uh, throughout 2008 and 2009, every single clinician, we have 1,200 clinicians, so every single clinician was given five days of recovery-oriented training. We called it the shared journey. Um, and you know, taking unionized staff and clinician staff off the point of care and giving them five days of mandatory education was, was a big deal, it was a big investment. But it was felt at that time that was what was necessary to break from the past and truly uh, do things differently. It resulted in this, um, and it's arguable whether this is clear. <laughs> I would say it's not. Um, but it resulted in this, which is the interprofessional collaborative recovery model. This is, I think, a bad graphic, uh, quite frankly. And, and we're in the process of changing it. Um, but it, it tried to cram every single thing onto one metric, onto one identity, about interprofessional care, uh, the notion of the client being at the center, including the family and the community, that there were multiple components to it. Everything that I just talked about is, is kind of in there. Um, but it, that's hard to kind of make, make sense of. An easier way to make sense of it is to look at our strategic plan. And our strategic plan has recovery, right, as the guiding principles. This is what our organization stands for. This is what we're doing. Everything, every single action, every single notion, everything that we do at Ontario Shores is grounded in that plan. Our, our senior leadership team is, is truly um, oriented in keeping things in a very disciplined operating plan fashion. So I've seen lots of organizations where the strategic plan is just the thing and, and then the business is over here. Not at our place. At our place everything happens based on that. Um, and you can see recovery is front and center. Uh, it really is the guiding principles. Because I think we believe that engagement, um, engagement as one aspect um, that true partnership delivery, it's not a tool. It's not something that you just kind of bring out when you want to um, engage in a specific operation. You know, oh yeah, let's do, let's do that through uh, an engagement strategy or an engagement process. No, th this, is, this is a core defining principle. It is a strategy. And, and this comes from Leonard Kish, who's actually a health IT consultant um, out of the US and, and, and a big technology-based person. And similarly to us on Ontario Shores, we've been trying to think about all of the various aspects and all the various ways uh, that we can use uh, technology in the digital world that we live in these days to empower and support people in a recovery journey. I think the consensus for us at Ontario Shores and, and growing across the country is that you can't have personal recovery as separate from clinical recovery. They're, they're synonymous and they're mutually supportive. There is a role for all of us in this aspect together. Again, trying to do something that neither one of us can do as individuals. Recover personally and recover from a health perspective as well. And they're, they're part of the business um, that can't operate without each other. The challenge has been, and I think the reason why we've had to do it in that educationally based uh, mandate, is the notion that it's tough to mandate recovery. You have to believe it. You have to be schooled in it. It has to be, again, the vision and the values. It can't just be a check mark of things that you're doing on your performance appraisal or things that uh, you're told to do because this is the, the condition of doing work. When recovery really works, it's because people feel passionate about it and they know that there's something here that can actually result in good outcomes. And let me show you a couple. When I came to Ontario Shores, um, it was with this lens. Um, 
because um, I was bringing a trauma-informed perspective. You can't work in emergency departments and not be influenced by the trauma-informed uh, notion. Um, but I was struck um, that still too often um, we were having discussions about what's wrong with a person. And I wanted to try to help have that discussion as what's happened to the person. What, you know, why are they in this kind of place and, and why are they uh, experiencing things as they've experienced them? What's happened to the person, not what's wrong with the person? Because trauma is everywhere in our clinicians, uh, in our patients, in the families, in our service users. Vicarious trauma or real trauma experienced is everywhere and the statistics are frightening. And sometimes we do it to them by putting people in restraints, by putting people into seclusion. We're contributing to that trauma uh, experience. So our mandate and my mandate was really to reduce um, restraint and seclusion. Uh, and we followed a strategy by doing that, the six core strategies that came out of the US um, that really talk about uh, a philosophy of how to go about restraint and seclusion prevention. Um, just for interest here, uh, you can see you know, we, had, we laid it out uh, over a five-year process of everything that we were going to do to try to reduce restraint and seclusion. Um, because I didn't want to be part of an organization that had high numbers of this and on the other hand talked about being a true recovery organization. I thought those, those were conflicting priorities. So we've reduced restraint and seclusion by 92%. Um, since our organization got started. Um, that's a sustained um, and methodical shift downwards. Um, and we did it because we think it's important to do. If you're wondering why there was an uptick there, like most people wonder why there's an uptick there, uh, it's because we actually changed measurements. When we actually, the way we measure, when we actually moved to a truly digital and paperless system, uh, I, I became quite confident about what those uh, numbers were, where I, I wasn't so confident about where I had before. So we're down 92%. There's lots more to do. Uh, we're going to continue that journey moving forward because, again, this is important aspects for us. Um, but in the last two minutes, I talked about the digital revolution. Um, and we, we're Canada's first stage seven hospital, which is a truly paperless organization. We're actually the first uh, mental health facility in the world to be uh, a truly digital integrated uh, organization. And when you have that type of computing power and analytical power and capabilities, you can do some interesting things. Uh, and we had the idea, okay, let's, let's use the technology to continue to support uh, our recovery principles. How can we do things like virtual care and telepsychiatry so that we can meet people on their terms, in their houses, in their places, not expect them to come to us under our terms and our conditions, for example. We can use clinical practice guidelines and embed them directly into the health records to support our clinicians on making daily decisions about how uh, they can use recovery principles. And the one that I'm most excited about is our patient portal. The notion that no longer does somebody have to come to our place, line up for an hour, fill out a form, give a check of $25 for photocopying, and hope that we will release their own health record to them. The first few years at, at Ontario Shores, one of my jobs was to sign off on the appropriateness of the release of records. And quite frankly, in the four years before we launched our patient portal, I never said no. But I would get you know, hundreds of requests. And I was just saying, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. And I think I got tired of saying, of course, of course, of course, of course. So I said, why don't we actually create a principle where people can get their records? Because it's their information. It's their stuff. Um, so we, we built their patient portal. And the patient portal actually allows a person to interact with their health record in a number of ways. It's, it's at this moment in time, uh, and this is the last point I wanted to make, it, it's at this moment in time just one way. And I'm not satisfied with that. We're, we're having bi-directional discussions because I think the really cool part is going to be when people can upload their data into the health record. Then we have a truly interactive system. 
right now, and it's a technological limitation, uh, quite frankly, not a policy one. Um, but we're, we're working on building the technology so that we can use service user data, whether it's you filling out forms in your home and sending them in, whether it's your Fitbit uploading your, your health and stats moving forward. We're interested in that kind of divide of how we can do this kind of work. But right now, it's unidirectional. And a person can securely text message their care teams whenever they want to ask a question. Um, there's, you can download the health record. Um, it's really helpful to download your health record uh, and to interact with it. You can look at your medication list and see all of the data about your medications. You can download all your lab reports. Um, you have control of this. If you don't have an email, we'll sign an email address, which you need to log on to the patient portal. We'll create an email address for you and get you onto the portal. Because again, we think it's necessary and we think this is an important stuff. So that future piece, the ability to document into the own chart, that's where we're moving next. And I think that will be uh, the crowning achievement uh, of this uh, as we pull it forward. So um, over the last uh, 50 minutes, we've done a number of things. We've talked a little bit about the core concepts of recovery. We've talked about how those are being front and center within the Mental Health Commission's activities. And I've shown you some of the local things that we're doing at Ontario Shores that I, I think are, are pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, and they're part and parcel of that kind of ongoing delivery. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about the 30,000 foot level uh, discussion about these things. And uh, I invite you to come by to the workshop this afternoon where we'll go into a little bit more granular detail on it um, and talk about that really hard work uh, of actually pushing this forward. And, and the pushback that, that comes sometimes and the, the, the genuine uh, debate about how, do we, how are we going to do this and why should we do this and where is that going. Um, we'll, we'll engage in that discussion about how to, how to do it at the local level. I, I'm on social media everywhere. I tweet about this stuff. Uh, I'm constantly pushing out. If any of you are in the social media game, uh, join the discussion. Let's, let's continue to have this uh, moving forward. Thank you. I think we'll take a few questions. All the latecomers, it'll teach you for standing at the back. <laughs> there are seats. There are actually one seat for everyone here. So if you have a seat next to you, could you put, put your hand in the air so that people can come and take their seats? So if you want a seat, <coughs> this is where the seats are. <coughs> okay. Um, as the parent of someone living with schizophrenia, I'm certainly wanting all possible recovery, and there are many aspects of what we're hearing which are terrific. But I want to point out an area of concern. Absolutely. The U.S. National Institute of Mental Health says that the biggest ongoing factor in the disability of people with schizophrenia are cognitive losses, not positive symptoms, negative yep. symptoms, but actual cognitive losses. And unfortunately, um, people really aren't dealing with this very much in this country. Uh, people in psychoeducation programs, unless they are fortunate part of early psychosis intervention programs, don't even learn about this aspect of their own illness. Whereas in other areas, people are really trained well. Families don't learn about this. And we're also not learning about um, some pretty much evidence-based cognitive remediation programs. It's wonderful in thinking about the training of the workforce and what that should constitute. Many people in the workforce now, unfortunately, have never had any science-based education about psychosis. And so they are being asked to help treat illnesses that they don't really understand, and for instance, about cognitive losses. Uh, the peer-delivered guidelines that were established um, a year ago uh, don't include any training about mental illnesses. So I just wonder if you think the recovery model might be tweaked uh, and become more effective if some of these current deficits 
could be addressed. Absolutely. Um, and, and to be clear, this is not the recovery model. Uh, this is an aspect of the recovery model that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. The recovery model is much bigger than that, and I think would uh, speak to the notion uh, that we need to do more. We need to um, be looking at all of the newest uh, pieces of evidence, and in some respects the older pieces of evidence that we just don't do. Um, like uh, those cognitive rehabilitation pieces. That science has been around for, for a long time. Um, and in the rush to medication administration uh, issues and the, cog the cost containment uh, issues, we, we have kind of moved away from um, that truly wraparound service delivery model. I, I don't talk about it much, but uh, I'm, I'm also a parent uh, with lived experience. Um, so I know exactly what you mean. And uh, I think, uh, personally, I feel very strongly and in agreement with uh, where you are uh, and what you're talking about. Uh, what we do as a system is not yet what we have to do as a system. Uh, and we continue to have that discussion. But in, in the limited aspect of what I've presented, I don't want you to think that that is everything that recovery is. That's, that's just a, a snapshot and a take on one portion of the recovery movement. I would think the bigger recovery principles would welcome all of that. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions if people want to. There are a microphone. If you just go to the microphone behind you, Chris. Very short question. Hi. I'm Chris Galanis. I'm a family physician. Um, I think it might be helpful. Um, maybe I'm dense, but um, there's a lot of use of the word recovery, and especially you're using it a lot. So I'm going to ask you to define it. Uh, no, that, that's a, a actually an excellent question. Um, for me, sorry. For me, it's um, it's a, an excellent question. Um, I think for me it's been about um, that a person with an illness can live to the best possible uh, aspect of their lives in spite of or despite the illness. Um, that they have dreams, they have skills, they have uh, knowledge that can all fundamentally influence the way they live their lives and that from a systems perspective the system will support them in doing so. So I think recovery is the personal journey of a person not limited by an illness, but succeeding despite it. And the one I've talked about today, the way the system can support that journey. Good morning, Ian. I'm David Butler, the family counselor with BCSS. Hi, David. Hi there. I had a couple of um, questions for you. One, um, providing um, all your staff with five days of recovery training is very expensive. Oh, yeah. And I'd like to know <laughs> how you ensured that the actual practice and the learning was embedded once that had um, been completed. And the other one is, how do you ensure that your, um, your services are recovery-oriented? How do you monitor and audit your services, and is that internal or external? Um, great question, and that's very much the discussion for this afternoon and in the workshops. Um, we put it on our balanced scorecard, just to give you a, a brief, brief principle. We actually measure, uh, we have two measurements on our balanced scorecard, so publicly declared. Um, and they are the measurements of individuals recovering within our organization, and the new one is the measurement of the recovery orientation of the organization. Now it's external to the point that we ask our service users and families and community members to rate the hospital. Um, it's not our own rating of ourselves. Um, that would seem somewhat disingenuous. Um, so we very much uh, are interested in the measurements and I'll talk in more detail about that this afternoon. Um, the other thing was, um, and you can guess, yeah, it was a five-day uh, Big Bang approach to orientation the very first year. And that was great for the first couple of years. And then you started to see slippage. 
and you started to see the reversions back to traditional kind of principles. So we've gone through a number of different refreshers. We don't call it shared journey anymore. Um, it was so expensive that all of the resources, I think, and, and I wasn't there at this time, but my colleagues who were at told me it was so expensive that all of the resources went into the initial education and there wasn't the sustainability educations. Um, so we, we failed, I think, uh, in, in that approach to move it forward. What we've come back to now is two, three, and four revisions of recovery. Um, and we continue to work through, through the strategic plan and through every single action plan that the organization works on, we ensure that there's recovery-oriented principles. I, I can talk in great detail, maybe offline with you, about um, how those translate into the work of the organizations to keep those moving forward. But if any of you are contemplating a massive expenditure for uh, education and a big bang approach, you may want to reconsider. Um, make sure there's a sustainability plan for that education. It's not enough to do it just once. And thanks for the opportunity to clarify that point. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ian. My pleasure. Thank you.